thank you very much. Um, I'm just actually going to start very quickly before I say anything, just to read a poem uh, that uh, steadies me down a little bit just before any kind of uh, speaking. Um, this is a poem called The Card. Um, and I wrote it, it's, it's for my mother, it's about my mother. It was written when I was uh, a teenager. And uh, I, I, I always begin by reading it because it does help me um, ground myself a little bit. And she's not a woman that would normally do that, but, uh, <laughs> but this works. The card. I used to lie on the floor for hours after school with the phone cradled between my shoulder and my ear, a plate of cold rice to my left, my school books to my right. Twirling the card between my fingers, I spoke to friends who recognized the language of our realm. Throats and lungs swollen, we talked into the heart of the night, toying with the idea of hair dye and suicide, about the boys who didn't love us, who we loved too much, the pang of the nights. Each sentence was new territory, a door someone was rushing into, the glass shattering with delirium, with knowledge and fear. My mother never complained about the phone bill, what it cost for her daughter to disappear behind a door, watching the card stretching its muscle away from her. Perhaps she thought it was the only way she could reach me, sending me away to speak in the underworld. As long as I was speaking, she could put my ear to the tenuous earth, allow me to listen, to decipher. And these were the elements of my mother, the earthed wire, the burning cable, as if she flowed into the room with me to somehow say, Stay where I can reach you, the dim room, the dark earth. Speak of this, and when you feel removed from it, I will pull the card and take you back towards me. Thank you. It's amazing how there are structures kind of alive in your mind. I wrote that when I was about 17 or 18. And mentioning things like the underworld and that idea of, uh, of, of Persephone. And, uh, and after I wrote that poem and it was, it was published, someone said to me, uh, that's a, a lovely retelling of the Persephone myth. And I had no idea what they were. I very quickly got on Wikipedia to find out who Persephone was. Um, but uh, I'd just like to thank you very much for, for having me here today. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about... Uh, uh, moments of astonishment and for me a lot of those moments are found in uh, in the reading and writing of poetry I suppose we all know what it feels like to be astonished or to be caught off guard by um, by things that that surprise us but it's very hard to put into words um, what kind of experience astonishment is especially um, the kind of creative astonishment I'm talking about um, but I think its essence lies in looking at things differently, in finding something new or, or, or finding some new or sympathetic elements in, in places and people, in landscape or memory and things that, that we think we're f familiar with, but finding something new in them or, or looking at them in a different way. Um, and because astonishment is such a difficult thing to, to describe, we can only hope to translate the experience into the poem so that the readers feel it themselves in the act of, of reading. Um, so I would just like to continue reading uh, a few of my own poems, if you don't mind. Um, I started in 2005 writing a collection of poems based on the Kailuk, on Kailuk Vera, the Hag of Bera. Um, I'm from the Bera Peninsula myself. Um, there's a rock down there on Ballycrovan Harbour, for any of you who know the area. Uh, and there's a rock 
that is supposed to be the petrified remains of this woman, this goddess figure who was supposed to have carried rocks in her apron and set them down in piles along the coast. And those are the mountains and the, the coastline that we have now. Um, and she is supposed to start her life by turning from, from a stone into a woman. And I thought that was such a powerful image of of endurance, you know, something that lasts in the landscape um, and something that we can look at and, and think about it differently. Um, and I thought it was such a powerful image and I decided to use that in the, in the book. And these are just poems about a woman telling us about her life. Uh, it's a love story, a woman who falls in love with a fisherman who is lost at sea. Um, somebody remembering their, their youth and relationships. Um, and I'll start with this poem called Birth. Uh, and it, it has that image of the stone changing into a woman. Now comes November, my birth time, and white ribs of tide uproot the silence of the bay. Today I break from stone onto sand, motherless, my mother a stone bedding the earth and dreaming my image. I stretch like a snail from a deep sleep, my flesh gathering its warm fabrics and unknitting me from this womb. I listen and mimic the flood tide, open my ears to the hall of shells, sheer salts erupting my birth cry. My eyes lift as the day begins to shape itself light being emptied into it as a soft fall of rain sweeps my moss-lined palms. I tread into this soaked brightness, bogland and the air full of fuchsia. This is the blood and bone of my mother, sheets of grass and weed, all her flushing skins I lean on with my hands and knees. Feeling a thirst gently pull, I bring my mouth to the fall of water from a leaf to taste the cool, plentiful drops. I shake the drench from branches, my limbs and lips moving fluently, the way a full throat learns to move for its earliest swallowing. So. Uh, these are all stories that I heard growing up um, on the Bear Peninsula, especially in primary school, we had a great uh, primary school teacher who taught us through storytelling and nature walks around the place, and we learned about our, our landscape, um, townlands and what they meant, and you know we could really locate ourselves there. Um, this next poem is called Sister, and it tells the story about how the standing stone came to be on Bear Island, um, and it's it's a story about a, a row, a fight, or an argument that, that on Kailuk Vera, the Hag of Vera had with another goddess figure, and they started firing um, stones back and forth to each other across the, the Castletown Bear Harbour. And one, one of them was on top of Bear Island, and one was on top of Mishkish Mountain, which is on the mainland. Sister. It wasn't my calf she killed that screamed its absence but the green viciousness in her eye, exploding like water over coals as she tasted the blood. No sooner she slaughtered than she ran, smiling, and I after her up the soft slopes, my skirts chiming against the grass. Sister bitch, she was always a cocky thing but slow. Honestly, I preferred her dead, her black teeth chilling in the mud like an afterbirth. So we planned a war for morning, after breakfast. When the houses began to yawn their shadows, I dressed warmly, climbed the mountain and piled rocks by my ankles. Size, weight and number, a stone for her side. Hissing, she stood on an opposite hill, flinging her stones, missing me one by one. The sun couldn't throw such fires. I hit back at her catcalls, her blood, her startled face as her slim feet began to stumble on the ledge. Every rock I threw tunneled through the air and drowned her ears with their dullness. 
I charmed her tongue to such sweetness then. She cried reason, so I reasoned with that, seeing her look down where the grey rocks open like the rageless mouths of rooks. I admit she held her fists until the end, her arms spinning and spinning in the wind's loom. Just as she staggered to the edge, I readied my smile and flung my last. A breath, a clear breath, sister, to help when your balance snaps. So. Uh. I have four sisters, so I could relate to, the <laughs> to those kinds of stories. When I, was, when I started writing these poems, the, the, it, it started off when I came across the, the early Irish um, poem, The Old Woman of Bear, and, uh, by that prolific writer, Anonymous. Uh, and there was a line in it where she said, I'm not only miserable, but I'm old. And I thought, a woman from West Cork now we can do a bit better than that. And uh, I get decided to give her a few love poems and uh, m memories of being a, a young woman and falling in love. And she falls in love with a fisherman. And, I, and when, I, when I was writing these as well, the, that first James Bond film came out with Daniel Craig. And I, I had that picture of him coming up out of the ocean and uh, you know, <laughs> striding in towards the, the shore. Uh, but, but anyway, this is a love poem about them kind of coming together and moving in together, really. It's called Promise. The grey sound of rain on the roof, sound and light splitting on my skin like flint pieces working me. I am preparing a place for you, cleaning down the walls and worktops, making space in the wide rooms, in the small rooms, doubling things needed. Roses I found growing around the bridge, I lay on your pillow. Though time and love go round like dancers, in time I won't be able to tell your name from mine, to separate your voice from my voice within this house. My love, I am at the table waiting. When you come home, my hands shake like rain breaking on the knotted waves. Um, this next poem is called Children of the, of the Kalinuk. Uh, Kalinuks are burial grounds. They were used up until the, the 1960s or 70s for um, children who died before they were baptised. And because they weren't baptised, the, the souls of these children weren't thought to, to be able to enter heaven or the Catholic kind of, uh, you know, um, circle on the way up. But, um, and, and the, the, these, the mothers believed that the souls went to limbo. And I wrote this poem after hearing on the radio when the Vatican were debating the existence of limbo. And two women rang up, Jerry Ryan, and uh, devastated because they had children who were buried in these uh, clinics. And they, they, they were saying, you know, where are our children now? We thought they were in, in limbo. You know, and we were maybe not okay with that, but we, that's where we believed they were. And it was like a loss all over again for them. They were grieving all over again and, and trying to find where, where their children were. Um, and these are incredibly moving places to go to visit. They're, the little graves, they're just marked by just slabs of stone and they're usually in the corners of fields. Um, so this is in the voice of one of the children comforting um, the mother. Children of the Kalinuk. Come to us with lilies and meadow sweet. Come to us by heart and not by sight. That heaving of love which aches still, coffined in your belly's darkening loam. Mother, I've known your weight and the length of your soft hands bent over this rugged, unworked soil. I've known you by the forgetful daisies strung with blue and red twine. I open my eyes. You are watching me. If ever I am allowed a voice, you will know me when I speak. 
If I were on winged in nothingness, I would bring home to you a memory of wings. The scythe which undercuts life, I remember. And above, a chorus of birds, the petals of daisies lifting. Hear me. I will know you again among the crickets and billowing trees. We will survive the earth. Are you not my mother? Was it not you I heard in the thrashing dark? The one whose hands I felt unbury me and baptize my soul in a fountaining of tears. So I think I, do I have time for two more or how are we doing? One more? Yeah, very quickly. Um, so actually, yeah, I'll finish up. That's very nice, actually. Fit in. Um, this is a poem called Healing. It's, it's uh, very new. I've just written it in the last few weeks. Um, I, I, it's, when I was writing it, I was thinking about our country and about our people and about the world. Um, and it was written around the time of the, the Great Thaw in January and uh, I went up for a walk up the mining road up behind our house and th it was just when the ice was really starting to melt and you could hear all the, the water coming free and coming loose underground and, and overground and it just it felt like a, a freeing up, a healing. That first day of springtime thaw, when the ice began to melt and pour down the mountains, I walked to the top of the old mining road to hear all the slow loosening and letting go, the kickback of copper and clay from my heels, the steady blasts following like the sound of another person's footfall on the shale, spirited behind me the streams that thundered down to disappear again underground so that the whole place was all tremble and go, lightening into a stiller and clearer air. I loved the copper lit, the downhill skid and slack, the water roar out of time, turning back with so much sound and rush that it seemed to be gathering strength from ore and dust and clay, under the shade of that green and beaten ground. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>